All right. Uh, so I wrote a lightning talk, but uh, it got long. And so I'm going to do my best to keep it to a manageable length, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so if you saw my first lightning talk, uh, you'll notice a theme of splitting things up, uh, especially this new team I started on. One of our big idea, uh, big things is to split up the, the Rails monolith we have at work. So it's hot on my mind. This time I wanted to talk about the, uh, the separation of I.O. from business logic or business entities. Um, this is the Gordian knot. If, if you've ever wanted to learn how to tie one, that's how. Um, we're going to talk about how to cut one. So these are my questions uh, that I always put in the forward. Um, my intention is to talk to Rubyists who have been at this for a little while, but I am also rec cognizant of the, of the fact that this audience has some juniors in it. So I'm going to try and put some stuff in there that feels relevant to you as well. Uh, if you remember one thing, uh, I hope it's that, uh, that you should consider the impacts of splitting up IO and business logic. Uh, and more specifically, that the database is IO. And that's a thing that really broke me recently. So we're going to talk all about how I got broken. So uh, where did these ideas come from? I've been reading this book, Clean Architecture, by Robert Martin. Freaking amazing. Totally get this book, especially if you're a mid and you want to like really stump your seniors. It's really good at that. Um, so this book is, is about how to architect applications so that they can grow. Now, this is a thing that never really occurred to me because I've never worked in a place where an app had to grow. I've usually worked at agencies where it's like, this will be gone in two years. Now I work at New Relic. Our apps stick around for a long time. I have no skills here, but they don't know that. And they still hired me. So I got to learn real quick. Um, the main thing that I picked up from, from the parts of this book that I've gotten through is about splitting up I.O. And in particular, the database is a kind of I.O. And that our ORMs, like Active Record, are kind of uh, like tying us in or misinforming us here. And it, it gets really touchy. Um, so <laughs> this is a project that broke me completely open. Hanami is a web app, a lot like Rails. Um, there's a lot more going on in this app. But the cool thing was that this was a bunch of Rails core contributors who decided to read this book and try and reimagine what a web app would look like or what a web app framework would look like if you applied all the principles. The big thing that I saw, and this is where I kind of broke, uh, where my brain broke, was this idea that there's a lib folder, um, which we know and love, which is full of entities. But there's no database access in there at all. These are plain objects that have values and are constructed somehow, but I don't actually understand how. And then we also have an apps folder, which is full of web apps that have controllers and have all the things I'm used to seeing, but no models. And, and I don't know how the models become part of the thing. And so this really screwed me up for a long time. Uh, but I started seeing this kind of beauty where each of the applications could share things in that lib folder. That lib doesn't need to involve database access. And in fact, it doesn't have to be a database. One of those applications could get data from an API and still turn it into a totally viable object that has the same kind of data. That object doesn't know how to store itself or persist because it came from an API, not a database. So this is where I broke. And I just want to give you that context, because this question keeps coming up for me. Um, because now I start thinking about, well, if the web is just I.O., and if HTTP is just I.O., well, like HTML and JSON, are, they're just delivery mechanisms. Or, you know, delivery formats, right? HTTP is just the delivery mechanism. Printing is also a, a delivery mechanism. Um, like, I mean, nobody uses that, right? But, uh, but it's still a thing. What else? Um, any ideas about what else are delivery mechanisms? SMS. SMS, texting. Yeah, it's super great. API calls. What else? 
Someone's got one. SMTP. SMTP. Emails. Yeah, good. These are all just delivery mechanisms or delivery formats. Uh, and none of them need to involve the actual business logic of how do we find out what, you know, at my old company, how do we find out how much a house is worth? Well, my email and my web page and my faxes and my e-signatures and my SMSs, they all need to know that info. But none of them should know how to get that info from our database. They should just be provided that thing. That's super cool. Um, so I started naturally thinking, if I can abstract the interface and, and abstract the uh, delivery mechanism, that means I can do all of them, right? I can just switch them at will. Well, it turns out that is not the case. Uh, emails are different from HTML, and um, you can't just assume they're the exact same thing. But when we tried to, uh, when we started looking at switching uh, e-signature providers, it turned out to be nearly impossible because we hadn't at least pulled that code into a separate area and thought about it as a delivery mechanism in itself. It was spread throughout the whole code. It was a tangled Gordian knot. And the only way we were going to change at all was to, to make it an interface. This isn't about making it easy. It's about making it possible to change. Um, the other thing that taking I.O. out of the equation does is that it makes it really easy to test and reason and prove that your business objects are doing things that are reasonable. Uh, from a test, I can give an object the six values that are necessary to determine max financing on a house. But if I have to also send those over an API call or access a database, that gets really, really complicated. I knew this kind of superficially, but I didn't, it didn't really become concrete until I started thinking about how Hanami was structuring things and this idea that none of, none of this data came from the database or from the API. Um, so one of the scary things about Hanami, though, is that uh, if you're participating with multiple apps in your framework uh, and you have shared entities in a side folder, it becomes really easy for other teams to start changing them because they're shared objects. It also becomes very easy to clone them, though. You can have a user and a user with subscription and an opted out user. They're all fine. It's just data. But it becomes a little, it, it's a different equation. So I recognize that this is the part where I think a lot of people are like, yeah, Chuck, whatever. What does this mean? Um, so you're saying I should just switch to Hanami, drop my ORM, we're good, right? Um, no, that's ridiculous. Uh, just telling you from my last job, don't run something <laughs> that you built or that is not ready for production in production. <laughs> we ended up with a lot of microservices that were entirely unmaintainable because people wanted to try frameworks. Um, everyone who's worked with RF is laughing. Uh, but it is, it is fun. And maybe you have a, an ephemeral project or a code challenge that you want to try out and just play with this idea, that's great. So I kind of split this out into like career tiers because um, I, I don't know, had some interesting things. So for juniors, the way you can apply this to get more jobs is um, your code challenge will involve I.O. It's going to have file input. It's going to have, I don't know, even just taking input from the command line. There will be I.O. in it. If you split those, the main parsing from the I.O. into two files, you will get hired. <laughs> like, I, I don't know how to emphasize that enough, but um, I see a lot of code challenges come in. And one of the code challenges we had was uh, you have to take input from the file or from the command line. And most people will make a command line parser and a file parser, and both of them do everything. Or maybe they even subclass from a base class, but the base class is really confusing and abstract, and it gets really t terrible, and it's impossible to test. So I'm saying, make a file loader and a parser instead of a file parser and a, and a command line parser. Same thing. 
is a raining outside class, don't make just one class. Make also the, the Wonderground, the Weather Underground API, and the Weather Data Analyzer, generic weather data, right? It's not that hard, it's not that different, but it shows that you're thinking about separation of concerns, and you're thinking about the right separation. That's really important. So MIDS, also interesting. This is a thing that I wish I had done so much. Uh, when you're starting to write some API code, maybe you're working on API code that already exists, throw it in a folder. If you want to get really crazy, put the tests in that folder. Freak out your co coworkers. Treat it like a gem. Treat it like a separate thing entirely, but don't make a gem. Don't make a gem. There are so many problems with this that I don't even want to go into it. Just make a folder, pretend it's a gem. Life is going to be good. It's still findable. Your coworkers can still work on it. Don't make a gem. Pretend it's a gem. Sam. And by folder, do you also mean a namespace? Yes, also make a namespace. That would be really smart. Um, so again, this is not going to make it easy to switch to another API or another output or input method. It is going to make it possible. That's your goal. Um, it's not going to make it easy to make a microservice. That is hard, but it might make it possible. Um, the other thing you can do is start learning about boundaries and componentizing uh, through this one particular example. There's so many different places where you need to make boundaries and need to practice strong uh, interfaces. Um, but this is one concrete thing that has actual, like, File loading is a, is a thing. It's less abstract. So learn about it there. And then lastly, stump your coworkers that are, se that are seniors, because um, they know they should know this really well, and they don't. So that's fun. Um, and this is, this is the one where I get confused. Um, I am a senior right now, and I really have no idea how to do this. I am so broken right now. So I asked my coworkers, and this is what they said. Um, they, sh they said you should be teaching this to other people. And you should be doing thought experiments. Thought experiments are free. But it gets you thinking about the problem and the ramifications and what will happen six months down the line if you did apply this. And you can run it by all the seniors and take a lovely afternoon, drink some beers or whatever, and think it through. Here's some other stuff I was thinking about that I'm not going to go over. But you can see the amount of confusion I have. Um, <laughs> I just. I want to make it really clear, this is not a thing that you should learn and understand perfectly as a junior right out the gate. This is a thing that will confuse you for the rest of your career, <laughs> I think. Um, so here's my conclusion. I was hard. Business logic is hard, too. Don't tie them together. That's too much hard in one place. Um, your database is I.O., and it needs to be thought about that. Active Record may be lying about it, but you need to think about it that way. Um, and don't just jump. Um, learn from it, see where it applies, have some fun, but don't run it in prod. Please don't run it in prod. I'm Chuck. That's my email. Thank you. <laughs>